You know, it's it's like, just imagine like a, a bicycle with like, you know, like a, a one and a half wheels that's held together by scotch tape. We need a little more tape and, you know, like a little clown sticker and then, then it will be all right. You know, instead of saying, you know, I think we just need a whole new bike at this point. Like, I mean, this, let's just face reality. But that's exactly what they've been trying to do for years. You know, every time there's a problem, you kick the can down the road. You print up some more money, you borrow some more money. I don't see how this could possibly end in grief. Well, the, the stimulus thing, there are two points to make about stimulus. The first one, some economists uh, who support the stimulus uh, will indeed concede. And that is obviously if the government spends a certain amount of money to build a widget factory, let's say, well, then that money is not available to build an umbrella factory. So it's, it's sort of a wash, but it's, it's less than a wash because the umbrella factory would have been built because consumers wanted it, whereas the widget factory will be built because Chris Dodd or John McCain wanted a widget factory in his, in his district or something. So, so th that's a little different. That's not responsive to consumer demand. But more than this, though, what a lot of economists will miss is that think about what we've just said about the business cycle. What happens? What's going on with the economy during the bust phase? What's actually happening to the economy? Well, as we've seen, because of the artificially low interest rates, and here, in our case, housing was particularly blown up out of proportion, because housing is very interest rate sensitive, but the whole capital goods sector was completely blown out of proportion. We've got way too much spending in some areas and way too little in others. We've got imbalances in the economy. The structure of production has been thrown out of balance. How is that problem in any way addressed by the government spending a lot of money on politically arbitrary projects. I mean, how are economically arbitrary projects? They're politically well-conceived projects, no doubt. Uh, how is that? I mean, that's totally beside the point. So stimulus spending simply interferes with this natural purgative process by which the economy corrects itself and adjusts the structure of production in, in accordance with real consumer demand. It is, in effect, like drinking Red Bull instead of sleeping. It's like taking the remaining energetic part of the economy and just driving it into the ground, you know, just, just, just sucking whatever resources it can. Uh, now, on this stimulus thing, though, what you will hear some economists say is, yeah, yeah, I agree with you on this. You're right. If we take resources from over here and we spend them over there, you know, we haven't really accomplished anything. I agree with that. But, 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 they say, in a recession, we have idle resources. We have idle labor, idle raw materials, factories, whatever. So it's no problem to put them to work building a bridge or something. The, the problem with that argument is that inevitably, you will be drawing resources away from the productive sector of the economy. Because when you build that bridge, where are you going to get the bridge builders from? Are you going to get the, our unemployed financial services people going to build that bridge for you? I mean, in other words, are people unemployed coincidentally in the exactly the right proportion for skills for, for the project that's needed? Well, typically, no. Uh, so you're going to have to draw people from other construction projects. And now those projects are either going to have fewer people or they're going to have to uh, try to bid them back away and their costs go up. So inevitably, you're faced with um, challenging the private sector. And then finally, why are there idle resources? We never ask this question, why? Why would there be idle resources in the first place? And the answer is because of errors. Errors have been committed. The production process was all discombobulated. And it turns out we don't need people in this sector. We need them in this sector. We don't need re steel here. We need it there. We need to shuffle things around. That's why we have the idle resources. It was the, it was the errors, the original errors, because of the artificial boom. And so the analogy I've sort of given, and I adapt this from a Peter Schiff analogy, is imagine you're going to the Olympics in Vancouver. And everybody who's going to the Olympics, they all eat at local restaurants. And the local restaurant owners, somehow they didn't hear that the Olympics were coming. And so they just noticed they got a lot of customers. And they say, oh my gosh, hey, 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 wow. I, you know, and they, then they say you know, to their uh, family members, and you told me my cooking stinks. Well, look at all these suckers coming in. And they're so excited about it. You know, they, they expand their capacity. They open a second location. And then the Olympics are over. And then they don't have as many customers anymore. Well. The question would be, do we want to stimulate these idle resources back into use? Of course not. They were a mistake to start with. They shouldn't have been done in the first place. What we need to do is put them to some productive use. And, and you know, you're, not helping, you're not helping the economy by stimulating back into existence something that's just going to suck wealth out of it. That, that, that can't possibly help. So what I will leave you with then is that 
I, I, what I've tried to suggest here tonight is that the experts are really, well, have led us down a blind alley. I, I'm being as generous as I can. And I am glad that we are at a university that respects the idea of diversity of opinion and allowing people who have different points of view to, to come in and address the, 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 sub, uh, the uh, subjects at hand that are facing us today, uh, especially given that the Austrian School of Economics is coming into a lot more, uh, is getting a lot more attention. It's a subject of a lot of public discussion. People are interested in it. They're learning about it. We've never seen this much interest in it, uh, really, uh, maybe in the whole 20th century. Uh, it is absolutely taking off, and it's, it's wonderful that we have this opportunity to talk a little bit about it. Um, people sometimes write to me and say, I want to learn more about this, but where do I even start? Like, what am I supposed to start with, a 900-page book? Like, I mean, come on, like, what do I start with? And I actually came up with a little program for how you can do this. And even if you don't have time, and all you have time to do is listen to things in your car, I got you covered. I have a, a little page that I developed called LearnAustrianEconomics.com. I bought that domain name. I don't know why it was available, but I bought that thing. <laughs> So if you go to learnaustrianeconomics.com, it's organized, like, here's what you should start with, here's the next thing, here's the next thing, so that you too can be a cool guy like Peter Schiff and, and uh, you know, slay all the dragons out there. But be careful how you use these intellectual tools. This is not the way to win friends, right? To <laughs> smash them all the time and send them home feeling silly. I mean, you know, you have to use these things generously because we're not claiming that everybody who failed to see this crisis is an imbecile. I mean, we're not saying that, but that simply they could benefit from this particular uh, knowledge. So the experts are not coming to save us. The experts are the ones who have buried us, I'm afraid to say. Uh, we've got Ben Bernanke, our Fed chairman, who has been, I would say, pretty much so wrong with everything that's come out of his mouth that it's actually helpful. Because you, you just reverse each statement, and you have a really good sense of what's going on. Like, I don't think so-and-so will happen. You say, oh, well, batten down the hatches. This is coming. Uh, or let's say Hank Paul, this is my favorite one, Hank Paulson. Remember the former uh, Treasury Secretary said uh, in July 2008, here's what he said. Notice how he words this. He says, uh, he was on TV, he was asked about Fannie and Freddie, uh, which I didn't have time to talk about tonight, but he said, Fannie and Freddie, he says, uh, yeah, you know what? I don't know what you're worried about. Their regulator says they're, they're adequately capitalized. Two months later, they have to be taken over by the government. So then Paulson is back on television. Now look, <laughs> we're pretty sure you said they were adequately capitalized. And you know what his answer was? I never said that. I said their regulator said that. <laughs> Come on. Like, can you believe we, the indignity of being ruled by scam artists like this? We have to suffer this indignity every freaking day? And Paul Krugman, to add insult to injury, saying what we need right now is the very thing that's going to cause the problem, low interest rates. And then he has the nerve, years later, to say, you know what? I predicted the housing bubble. Well, yeah, because you called for the very thing that brought it about. I predicted that this Coke I put in the fridge would get cold. I mean, whoa, wow. Congratulations. So the beautiful thing, therefore, about all this, how we bring this all to a close, is that we have been liberated from the gatekeepers of opinion. Because normally there'd be a crisis like this, there'd be one version of the narrative, you know, we stupid rubes can't be left to our own devices and our overlords need more powers over us. And then it would just simply be, well, which way do we gin up the economy? Do we print some money or do we just borrow it? I mean, like, that would be it. Like, then the, that's the whole range of opinion. And if you're not somewhere in this three inches, then you're, you're not respectable, you know, whatever. But the beautiful thing about what we're enduring, what we, we are experiencing now, is that, as one of my friends puts it, the gatekeepers of opinion are still there. The gates are indeed up, but the walls have come down. And we're able to get around them and to find out uh, the truth about what's happening to us, what's likely to happen to us, who was right, who was wrong. Uh, which people should be listened to in the future, and if, and indeed only if, we understand this lesson, then we might hope to establish the indispensable foundations of lasting prosperity. So thank you very much, and I'll entertain some questions. Um, am I the question prompter? Uh, we might as well, well, I guess we'll just alternate between the microphones. Okay, yes? Uh, you talked at length about how um, artificially low 
low interest rates cause a lot of problems. And I was wondering if we could at all determine what the actual interest rate would be and then artificially raise them to get a back relationship. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah, good, good question. Um, I don't think there really is a way to do this because there, the the um, the determinants of interest rates are are, are so numerous in the you know with, with, there's so many factors that tend to push them up and down. I mean, ultimately they're based on so-called time preferences, but in practice there are uh, a lot of different factors that go into it. So it's very hard. I mean, it's sort of similar to asking the question: um, if the interest rates are artificially low, uh, I mean, it would be almost like if we said. Wouldn't it be nice if we had businessmen who knew what the real rate ought to be? And then they could make their, their borrowing decisions on the basis of, well, I know they're trying to trick me with this phony baloney rate, but I know it really should be this, and so I'll just go ahead and do it. I think, it, unfortunately, I think it would be akin to sort of saying, if we, if we controlled all the prices in the economy, and then we just, we just said, well, it, could entrepreneurs kind of figure out what the prices of consumer goods really ought to be if the controls weren't there? Could they correct for this? And entrepreneurs can do a lot. They can, they can see through a lot of the white noise that's introduced. But the whole point of a price system and the whole point of, the, of interest rates is precisely that. No one human mind can have all this knowledge in his head at once in order to determine uh, the real truth of the matter. Uh, we need the decentralized process of the market with each individual market actor making his contribution to the interest rate or to the price of milk or whatever in order to really know what it is. So I'm afraid there really isn't. Uh, there really isn't a way to do that. I, that would be nice, though. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I suppose I see two people wearing shirts that say, end the Fed. That would be step one. Then you'll know what the real interest rate is. <laughs> I am so good at cheap applause lines, man. I got, I got a whole bunch of them. <laughs>